Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is the literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you, and please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other, and with you, in an effort to bring us together. So if you missed our last episode with Jillian LaRusso and Roger Rosenblatt or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Bird's Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts a reading by and conversation with Anne Fadiman and Luann Walker. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with Crowdcast, the chat is to the right of your screen. Please feel free to comment throughout the evening. But if you have a question, look at the bottom of your screen and you'll see Ask a Question tab. And that's where I will look to ask any questions that you might have. The green link is the at the bottom of the page is the link to this episode on Bird's Books website where you can purchase the author's books while supporting the bookstore and Write America. Our first speaker is Ann Fadiman. Ann Fadiman's most recent book, The Wine Lover's Daughter, a memoir about her father, wine, and the upsides and downsides of upward mobility was an NPR best book of the year. Her first book, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, an account of the cross-cultural conflicts between a family of Hmong refugees and their daughter's doctors, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction. She has also written two essay collections, Ex Libris and At Large and At Small. Fadiman is the Francis Writer in Residence at, resident, Residence at Yale and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is married to writer George Howe Colt. Please welcome to the screen, Anne Fadiman. Thank you so much for that really, really nice introduction, Alice. Um, and also thank you, Roger Rosenblatt, uh, whom I've known since my first year in college for creating this wonderful writers forum. I'm especially thrilled to be here on the same night as my dear friend of 47 years, Luann Walker, who's not only a marvelous writer, um, but also my former roommate. Uh, we shared a loft when we were in our 20s and figuring out how to make it as writers and editors in New York City. I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from my most recent book, The Wine Lover's Daughter, which is a memoir about my father, a literary critic named Clifton Fadiman. The title comes from my father's love of wine, which was a symbol of the kind of culture to which he aspired. Um, but I'm going to read tonight from two non-wine oriented chapters. And the first excerpt that I'm going to read is from a chapter called Oakling. It's about being the writer child of writer parents. A few years ago, I wrote an essay about Hartley Coleridge, a 19th century British poet who had the bad luck to be the son of a far more famous poet, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Hartley started off as a penniless, started off as a celebrated wunderkind and ended up a penniless alcoholic who often spent his days in alehouses and his nights in ditches. A review of the only book of Hartley's poetry published in his lifetime allowed that it manifested 
no trivial inheritance of his father's genius, a sincere compliment, if one that implied he had no genius of his own, but also cited an old adage, the oakling withers beneath the shadow of the oak. I am interested in oaklings because I am one myself. When writers beget writers, there are, of course, some advantages. There are plenty of books in the house. There is an example right under your nose that words are a plausible way to earn a living. There's the intimacy that comes when you and your parent like the same things and are both good at them. Despite the perks, oaklings face a universally acknowledged problem. The mighty oak grabs all the sunlight. One solution is relocating yourself as far as possible from the shadow. My brother and my half-brother chose not to become writers. They were thereby saved the angst of Nick Harkaway, John Le Carre's younger son, who said that becoming a writer would feel as pointless as standing next to a lighthouse and waving a flashlight. He became one anyway. When I was starting out as a writer, I briefly considered using the name Anne Whitmore. I figured my mother's maiden name was safely forgotten so that no one would assume I was trading on my father's reputation. I gave up the idea only because it seemed unfair. I was Anne Fadiman. Why should I have to pretend to be someone else? The classic Oakland problem is that it is hard to become one's own person when that person so closely resembles another, someone else's person. There were, of course, a few areas in which my father and I diverged. He was a critic. I was a journalist. He had meticulous work habits. I was a procrastinator. He was neat. I was messy. His idea of recreation was reading in an armchair with his back to the window. I preferred climbing glaciers. But I had to admit that our similarities far outnumbered our differences. We were not only both writers, but both devotees of Vermeer, late bedtimes, anagrams, and doggerel. Here's a poem he once sent me when I was contemplating a reporting trip to Mauritius. On the island of Mauritius, you will eat exotic dishes, all varieties of fishes, 13 different kinds of knishes, and especially delicious shish kebab and other shishes. You'll fare well with my best wishes if you journey to Mauritius. When we took the Johnson O'Connor aptitude tests, we both scored in the 95th plus plus percentile, 95 was the official maximum in English vocabulary, but the sixth percentile in left-handed finger dexterity. We both loved pasta, cheese, and lamb chops. We both hated pickles, mayonnaise, and garnishes. I shared his horror when a friend of his took us to the Quilted Giraffe, an Upper East Side restaurant whose very name represented everything my father detested about Nouvelle Cuisine, and he spied an ostensibly ornamental fragment of lettuce in the butter dish. It is a travesty, he said, to take a nice natural product and drape it with a disgusting piece of vegetable material, moist and horrible. My father lived to 95, uh, which, by the way, is the same age that Luann's father is now. You'll find out soon in a few minutes that both of us have chosen to write about our families. And when my father was 88 and he and my mother were living in Florida, he lost almost all his eyesight overnight from something called acute retinal necrosis. I was visiting at the time and I took him to an eye hospital where he was told that he was never going to regain his sight. And since his life was devoted to reading and writing, he figured his life was over and asked if I would help him commit suicide. And I gulped and said, well, uh, not right now, but do your damnedest for six months and then we can have this conversation again. And I didn't say I'd help him but I didn't say I wouldn't help him. So I knew I would spend those six months sitting on the edge of my chair in suspense. So uh, this next excerpt is from a chapter called VIP and it picks up 
after he's left the eye hospital and he has agreed to go to a day program for newly blinded adults. The program was run by the Visually Impaired Persons Center of Southwest Florida, VIP, a term that like so many euphemisms, tries to turn dross into gold. My father went there from 10 to three every Tuesday and Thursday for six weeks. The subject was independent living skills. He hadn't had an abundance of those, even when he could see. What was the point of learning how to cook wash his clothes and change his sheets in his ninth decade when he had a wife who already did those things for him. And in six months, he'd probably be dead anyway. On the afternoon of his first class, I sat in my New York loft waiting for him to call or rather for my mother to dial and hand him the receiver. The phone rang, I expected the worst. That may have been the most interesting day of my life, he said. I assumed he was being ironic. Except for the first day of my life, he continued, it was the most novel. There was nothing in my 88 years of experience that prepared me for it. He told me he had learned several skills. How to identify bills in a wallet, fold each denomination differently. How to distinguish coins, Use your fingertip to gauge the size and your fingernail to feel the smooth or ridged periphery. How to open a milk carton. Locate the two vertical edges with seams and press up the spout on the opposite side. The challenges were of the most mundane character, he said, sounding surprised that he had found them so fascinating. He'd always been bad with his hands, that sixth percentile in left-handed finger dexterity, and had outsourced all manual labor with the exception of opening wine bottles to wives and employees. Learning how to fold and pour and squeeze and having no doubt that he could do so competently really was novel. He had expected a room full of uncongenial bores and what had he found? An ego boosting conclave of nice old Jewish ladies, many of them originally from New York, who remembered him from Information, Please. That was a radio program that my father had emceed. The fact that he couldn't see them, uh, that he couldn't see them or they him was immaterial. 50 years earlier, they hadn't seen him on the radio either. The leader had announced, we have a celebrity with us today, Clifton Fadiman, and everyone had clapped. At VIP, my father actually was a VIP. Over the next several weeks, his fellow students turned out to be a more effective tonic than antidepressants. In the third week, after hearing a VIP student say she wished that she and her classmates could have Mr. Fadiman all to themselves, the leader suggested he lead a seminar called Fadiman's Conversation Class. My father recruited five enthusiastic acolytes and gave them a homework assignments. assignment. Listen to Larry King's radio talk show. The next day, just as he had guided clerks and stenographers through the great books in the night classes he had taught in the 1920s, he led a discussion in his inimitably plummy voice of Larry King's principal topics. He told me, your old man is back at his old job. The climax of the VIP program, an opportunity to apply many of the skills the students had learned was a visit to a simulated McDonald's that had been set up at a counter on one side of the classroom. Each student was given real money tucked into an envelope that was labeled wallet in giant letters for the benefit of the partially sighted. The customers lined up, ordered, paid with carefully folded bills and received their meals, empty bags and empty milk cartons and their change intentionally wrong, so they'd have to pay attention to the size and texture of the coins. In my father's case, given his taste for Tornado Rossini and his lack of enthusiasm for ketchup, it was just as well that the burgers were imaginary. VIP had doubtless chosen McDonald's because it was a restaurant with which every student in the room would be intimately familiar. Every student that is but one.
My father was familiar only with the idea of McDonald's. He had managed to spend decades complaining about American popular culture without actually experiencing any. Finally, his opportunity had arrived. It is true that it came in an unexpected guise, a fast food restaurant with no fast food, patronized exclusively by customers who couldn't see it. But what man can predict the form in which his enlightenment will present itself? My father completed the VIP program and never mentioned suicide again. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Our next speaker is Luann Walker. She is the author of A Loss for Words, a memoir about growing up with deaf parents. A professor in the Creative Writing and Literature program at Stony Brook, Southampton and Manhattan, she has written for the New York Times Magazine, O, The Oprah Magazine, Allure, and Esquire. She is the recipient of the Christopher Award, the Marguerite Higgins Reporting Award, and an NEA grant. Walker is founding editor-in-chief of TSR, the Southampton Review, a literary and arts journal. Please welcome to the screen, Luann Walker. Luann, let me find you here. There you go. Yay. Thank you so much, Alice, for that introduction. And thank you for doing this whole program. And thank you, Roger, for setting it up. And thank you, thank you, Anne, for that beautiful reading. It was so much fun um, to enjoy that from your voice. Um, I'm writing again about growing up with deaf parents and what's happened since A Loss for Words, my first book. Um, so here's a set, an excerpt from what I'm writing now called My Interpretation. Were you born deaf? A doctor asked my father. Again, we know this is snoopiness, or should we call it fascination on the part of medical professionals? Dad is in this office to get his toenails clipped. Most of the time he grins when asked that question and shakes his head no. But a few times the no is hard and swift and his face contorts to almost annoyance. No. On an icy February day, his mother had taken baby Gail, weeks old, to a relative's burial. She had no choice. They owned a funeral home and the dearly departed was a near relative. The month old baby caught a cold and struggled to survive. He was an oops baby, the youngest of seven, born to a mother in her 40s. Once he recovered in infancy, his sisters delighted in holding him and they called him puffball because he was plump as a puffball mushroom. Soon they shortened it to puff and no one would know that that nickname would become so relevant to him during his life. The alert toe-headed toddler was soon zipping around, delighted by the attention of his family, um, a dear heart to his mother, I don't know how old my father was when his family began to suspect he was deaf, but they probably understood pretty early because his oldest brother, 20 years older, Garnel, was deaf himself. Was it Grandpa H.T. or Grandma Nellie May who insisted they go visit the Mayo Clinic once they realized that dad was deaf? It was the beginning of the depression. The family had no money, certainly no money for a trip, but they just couldn't go through the deaf thing again. Uncle Garnell, who, as I said, was 20 years my father's elder, had been so difficult, so angry, such a, a hard child to raise. At Mayo, the doctor stuck triangular shaped tools into my father's ears. They covered his eyes, made noises. They tapped his knee joints with a hammer. They palpated his shoulders and back, listened to his lungs, and they felt the bumps on his head and the lumps in his throat. I can only imagine the scene when they were being dismissed. He's deaf, nerve deafness, no obstructions, no other reason, nothing we can do. I can see the flat line of my grandfather H.T.'s lips as they drove out to, as they walked out to the car. 
their Ford. The Mayo doctor had handed my father a tiny toy tin truck as a present. Dad, I'm sure, was happy. They got in the car in the Ford and drove southeast to Montpelier, Indiana, through a frozen landscape. Dad was sitting in the back seat, unaware of what was being said in the front. <laughs> Sorry, that's my dog, Riley. <laughs> um, uh, but suddenly, uh, and he was playing with the tin toy. When HT grabbed it and threw it out the window, Puff was silent. He saw that HT continued to drive, but Nellie's mouth was moving and she slammed her hands down on the dash. HT pulled the car to the side of the road. Nellie got out of the car, grabbed Puff's hand, and the two of them marched back to look in the snowbanks for the truck. It's story Grandma Nellie told her daughters because she had to explain why her shoes were so wet when they arrived home in Montpelier. Why did my grandparents stress the fact that Uncle Garnell was not born deaf? That at birth, the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck? That was 1907. He was a blue baby. But my father, there, there were five children in between. But his parents kept wondering, was God angry with them? Was it an accident? Years later, when the family realized that dad was deaf, they affixed the reason to that nasty February day in 1927. They didn't want to consider the coincidence of two children out of seven being born deaf. Deaf meant there could be a genetic component. Soon, Grandpa H.T. began researching and found out that he didn't want his children to be labeled deaf from birth. He joined several years later when Garnell married Imogene, his wife, and they didn't have children. Imogene was told she couldn't have children. And Grandpa H.T. would say, huh, she can't have children. There was a reason why he was saying that. It was because of the eugenics movement. Strange, isn't it, that modern eugenics would be the 19th century brainchild of Francis Galton, who was Charles Darwin's half cousin. But eugenics took over the country. In fact, it took over much of Europe. Alexander Graham Bell's wife and mother were deaf, but he was a strong anti-signer. He only believed in oralism. So for that reason, many deaf people in the United States who had jobs as teachers, as superintendents of schools, lost their jobs because they used sign. Signing was forbidden. That went part and parcel with the eugenics movement. Who were some of the eugenicists? Winston Churchill would become one. Edison believed in eugenics, certainly Bell. And there were laws passed in the United States that were forced sterilization laws. As a result of those laws, so many deaf people were sterilized. It was after I began researching this memoir that I realized that possibly my Aunt Imogene was sterilized or perhaps Garnell. It was the reason why dad had to say he was not born deaf. He didn't want that to happen to him. Forced sterilization laws were on the books beginning in the 19th century, and they continued in states like Indiana until the 1970s. In the 1930s, the Nazis thought that the United States was so skillful and so efficient in the forced sterilization laws that they copied our 
running of those laws, the usage of those laws. At that time, um, the Nazis would go to deaf schools and they would pick young women mostly, 14, 15. I read a letter in doing the research for this book about a 14 year old girl whose mother wrote, her mother was hearing, and the mother wrote to the school, to the local people and said, I don't want my daughter to be sterilized. They went ahead and did it because they were copying us in the United States who were so efficient. Now, not all of what I write um, is that difficult, but it was research that was important to me. But now I'm going to read from a loss for words because so much of my family, my growing up was joyous. Um, we just had a wonderful time uh, as my mother and father and my two sisters. It was just wonderful, um, that childhood. So now I'm going to read a section from a loss for words called Spies. I'm not quite sure when I decided they were spies. At one point or another, most children think they're adopted. I never saw it that way. I was convinced mom and dad had set, been sent to check on me. At about the age of eight, I wasn't politically savvy enough to think about who might have sent them, dispatched them to me or why, but there was one thing I was sure of. Mom and dad weren't really deaf. They were pretending not to hear so that they could know everything I was saying and denounce me for it. The tests I devised were simple and I thought ingenious. One of my employees was to go into another room and scream, Mom, help! Nothing. Then I'd drop a book on the floor and hold my breath. Nothing. I'd throw myself with a thud onto the carpet. No one came to check. Other times I'd sit on the floor in the living room and watch them while they read the newspaper. I wanted to see if they would make a mistake. Maybe they weren't as well trained as I had been led to believe. I'd sit for long periods of time watching the back of my mother's newspaper. When she brought the two sides together to turn the page, she'd catch me staring at her. What's the matter, she signed, her forehead wrinkled nothing. Why are you looking at me? The one thing that completely unhinged her was somebody staring at her at home, in a restaurant, anywhere. Sorry, mom, I was just thinking. I signed index finger circling my brow. She'd go back to her newspaper and peer around the corner a couple of times, not able to figure out what I was up to. While they were sitting in their easy chairs in the living room, I put my hand over my mouth lower my voice and announce, Doris, your shoes untied. Not a flinch. Gail, tornadoes are heading here now. Nothing. When those tricks didn't work, I decided to tail them. I'd walk up the stairs behind dad when he was going to his bedroom. Then he would head right. I'd make a wide circle around him, maybe even diving under the bed so I could catch his ankles and see what was going on. Mom was harder to follow. Even if I ducked into a room, she'd catch my reflection in the hall mirror. Her sixth sense was so keenly developed and she knew when someone was standing behind her. Usually she was amused by my game, but if I kept it up too long, she'd become exasperated. What are you doing? Go outside, go play. And she gestured toward the front door. One night before I went to bed, I fixed the phone cord just so. The next morning it was in exactly the place I left it and the next, and the next. Years later, as an adult, during an afternoon of reminiscing, I embarrassedly confessed my delusions to Kay and Jan, my sisters, only to find out that they too had both been convinced mom and dad were spies. Each of us, in our own turn, had concocted nearly identical tests for our parents. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Luann. Um, just what an absolutely wonderful reading. A Loss for Words, the second book that you, the second uh, 
the book that your second excerpt was from was the first major book by a coda, a child of deaf adults. Um, and I remember so clearly you writing it in your little niche, a very dark little niche under a loft bed in the loft in Soho, um, uh, where we were roommates for quite a few years, starting in 1978. Um, and uh, I want to talk about writing family memoirs, which is something that we've both done in a few minutes, but can we just wallow in nostalgia for a few minutes first um, and just talk about what it's like to be lifelong writer friends? Because I think that lifelong writer friends are so rare and they're just pure gold and we're in a trio of them. Um, and the third member of the trio is the comedian Jane Condon, who also spends her life with words and who has tuned in tonight. Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about what it was like when you and I were sharing this loft, um, just trying to figure out, could we actually make it as writers and editors? Could this word business actually keep us afloat? What do you remember from those days? Um, uh, I remember uh, the two of us sitting, there's a, a, a um, to get to the kitchen, you had to step up, and we would sit on that little step up, that little right, yeah, and and we would just talk late into the night or mm -hmm. sometimes the middle of the day, just talking about, gee, that happened. Um, I can't believe that editor did that, or oh, I'm really frustrated, or I'm really looking forward to writing about this or that. Um, so that was really fun. But what I want to talk about, or ask you about, Anne, is how you organized all of your files, because that was just so <laughs> astonishing to me. Yeah. Well, I was. Let's see. So when I was, uh, when we first moved into that loft, um, I think you were an editorial assistant at Esquire, and then you became an editor, including being the poetry editor of Cosmopolitan. And don't worry, I'll get to my files. I just want to sort of present our resumes in okay. their, their sort of full magnitude. And I remember the day that you brought back a submission that had been sent to you as poetry editor of Cosmopolitan. A woman had Xeroxed her breast. Um, I think you rejected it. Um, but, you know, it, end, it entered that wonderful sort of sh shared legends um, archive that we had. Um, and then you became editor of Direct. And then eventually you started writing A Loss for Words. So you were the first one to write a book. Um, for that uh, entire time, I was working at Life magazine. It really makes me sad that the two magazines where I've spent the most time are Life and Civilization, and they're both dead. Um, so when Life was alive, uh, I, I would usually go into the office at Rockefeller Center, but when I had a big piece, my editors would let me just go home and hole up for a few days. And I had the most bizarre circadian rhythm. And I just buy a lot of Haagen-Dazs. Remember that little corner store at the corner of Thompson and Prince um, and stock the freezer. And yeah, I would have just a ton of files, even for, you know, maybe a 5,000 word story. I'd have feet of files in, um, in, manila folders and lists of outlines. I think it's because I actually don't have a very good memory. And unless I organize things really carefully in advance, um, I know I'm going to forget everything that I want to put in a, a particular section. But if you remember me <laughs> staying up all night and working with those files, I remember you writing a loss for words um, in, you had a, a, a rolling wooden oak uh, desk chair scrunched under this tiny loft bed like a monk in his scriptorium and just turning out these wonderful chapters that then I would have the privilege of, of reading. It was the most incredible thing to think that in, uh, in most cases, I'd be the first person besides you who would get to read those wonderful words which of course were about people that I knew and loved since I of course knew your family and um, knew your parents and your dad is still alive and I still adore him. Um, so uh, compression was really important, both in terms of the writing and the space and that helped. <laughs> uh, 
toward that end. Um, but, you know, there was one time when you talked about styles of writing and you and I are so different in how we approach um, how we write. Uh, do you want to talk about how you um, perceive each sentence as you go along? Because I'm just the opposite. Yeah, I guess, I, I, yeah, I write sentence by sentence. I'm just incredibly myopic. I mean, I've done the kind of structural planning in advance so that I don't have to think about anything macro. And I can't really go on to the second sentence until I have the first sentence the way I want it. Um, if I feel that I'm going to have to revise the first sentence later and doesn't sound right, then I'm paralyzed. So how do you work, Lou? Um, <laughs> poor Anne, as you know, I just throw it all out. <laughs> <laughs> just go on and on and on. And then I have to go back and rewrite and rewrite. And of course, at that time, it was the typewriter. Um, and you oh, and I. The typewriter. You had this really cool IBM Selectric. And you were such a fast typist. And you would let me borrow your Selectric. This was before computers. And it had one of these like little balls. And it was just like, even had more than one font. This is like incredibly high tech. But it also meant that I had to type it again and again. And for me, that was really important because, mm. as you see, everything goes through my hands. So mm. typing it made me really focus on each word. So uh, I was jealous of you being able to have it every everything be just right before you went to the next part. And mine was all gibberish mess uh, for so much of the time. So it was it was a very different approach that we had. Well, let's talk a little bit about writing family memoirs. Um, Dodie Smith has called the family that dear octopus. And uh, that's just a wonderful way to think of it. Just dear. But on the other hand, it's te it's tentacular. Um, and there are just all kinds of complications when you write about your family. Are you going to hurt somebody? Who owns this story? If there are two different versions, how do you decide whose is right? How do you do the research? And I didn't feel able to tackle that until it was much, much older. So how did you get the idea of doing a loss for words? And how did you have the courage to um, do it when you were in your 20s? It's just, I still can't quite believe that you were able to be confident enough that you could pull off a book and such a difficult book on such a hard subject at such a young age. Um, well, I was completely naive um, and just dopey because you're not supposed to be writing memoirs that young. Uh, but I also, I just felt I, I was telling all the stories again and again. And then I decided, well, I'll just, I'll write it all down. Then if I go to a cocktail party, I can just hand the book and I don't have to talk about anything ever again. But it, it was also about um, respecting my parents and have, having other people respect them. Um, uh, that was just crucial to me. Um, I would teach sign language uh, in certain programs. And there was one time when I wrote about it when a psychiatrist came and he was in his mm, 70s. And as he was leaving the room, he said, well, children of defectives often feel guilt. And <laughs> so I just started doing research on that. I had a, a foundation grant to do so. And that was really helpful. Um, and then it just snowballed from there. Um, and I didn't write anything. I didn't publish anything about the writing until I'd gotten to finishing the memoir. But Anne, you did some incredible research for the wine lover's daughter. Do you, I just love hearing the stories. Will you, will you tell some of the stories about some of the experiments you went through? Well, I'll get to that in a second. I just want to say just a little bit more about a loss for words, because um, it seems as if the modern memoir uh, is often a way of um, opening the closet door and revealing the skeletons, um, uh, the trauma, the difficulties, the pain in your family. Um, so no wonder David Levitt's writing teacher once said that for every writer, it's a rite of passage to write the story after which someone in your family will never speak to you again. Um, but that was never going to happen 
the, the, to you because you had such an incredibly happy family. Whenever I saw you with your parents, they just had such a good marriage and they were so good at being parents. And uh, the pain in the memoir is all from the hearing world. Um, none of it is from inside your family. So I guess you didn't have to worry about what might hurt your parents' feelings because everything you were exposing about your family was incredibly happy. Um, except for one person whose um, name and character traits I changed. And mm -hmm. later, um, my cousin, who was the, the son of that aunt whose name I had changed, looked at me and I thought I'd been very skillful changing. He said, that was my mother, wasn't it? Um, mm -hmm. She was the one who was too embarrassed to be seen in a fancy restaurant with my parents um, mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. Uh, yeah. But he, he knew his mother's personality. I really thought I was good at changing that. <laughs> <laughs> he was probably the only one who recognized it. Now, yeah, I never could have written A Wine Lover's Daughter um, until after my parents were both dead. Uh, the parts that I read were very loving. The whole book is loving, but it also reveals a number of things about my father that he never would have wanted me to reveal. So I couldn't have done it at the age at which you wrote A Loss for Words. Uh, but you asked me about some of my research. So uh, one of the themes of the book is that my father absolutely loved wine and I don't particularly like wine and spent much of my life trying to pretend that I did in order to please him and be the kind of you know subtle cultivated person who loved wine. Um, uh, but I, when I was writing the book, I decided that I would go to a taste lab um, and actually uh, get a whole bunch of tests done and also get genetic tests done um, and discovered that I have a super sensitive palate, which sounds really great as if that would make me love wine. But in fact, it makes um, wine and pretty much everything else taste much too strong. I hate pretty much all liquor. Um, I also have a genetic variants that make me um, extra sensitive to bitterness and especially bitterness in alcohol. Um, I have a, a very keen sense of smell. Uh, biology basically proved um, everything that I've been wondering about all my life, but I didn't know <laughs> this was good or bad news. I mean, in a way, it got me off the hook. It was like saying, well, it's not that I am non-literary, it's that I'm dyslexic, let us say. Um, but uh, so it wasn't my fault. But on the other hand, there was no hope. I was never going to love wine. Might as well just throw in the towel. But I had all those tests after my father died. So, you know, he never uh, had to listen to the tragic news. Um, <laughs> so um, one of the things that has always sort of amazed me about our friendship over the years is that it's not just that we're both nonfiction writers and it's not just that we've both written family memoirs, but that we've also edited literary magazines and we also both teach writing. In other words, our resumes have been amazingly parallel through the decades. And yet I don't think that we have felt competitive or jealous. How did we not? I still haven't quite figured that out. Um, I don't really want to dwell on that. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I, it, it just, it, it didn't happen because we did, for the most part, go in very different directions. And yet there were so many similarities in our fascinations at times. Um, uh, gosh, I don't have a good answer. Maybe, you know, as I ponder it, I think maybe it's also that it's easier to be jealous of um, maybe either, I know that people can be jealous of their spouses, although I'm not jealous at all of my spouse, George Colt, who is a wonderful writer, but people are more likely to be jealous of acquaintances maybe than in, than really true friends. Our, our lives over the decades and long after we'd gotten married and um, knew each other's children and seen each other age. We're sort of a like a pentimento of all these different layers. Uh, there are not that many people still around who knew me in my 20s as well as you did. And so I can't imagine 
ever being jealous of you because I see all the wonderful layers of effort and achievement and talent and work that have gone into everything you've done instead of just sort of thinking, oh, darn, you know, she got something really good and I wish I, I'd had it. Um, so uh, here's, here's a nice quote from our mutual friend, Mark O'Donnell. Um, it's Mark O'Donnell uh, was a marvelous humorist, no longer alive, um, whom uh, Luann worked with at Esquire and he was a very close friend of my husband's. Um, and Mark was a twin and uh, he and his twin brother, an identical twin, he is his, his uh, brother, uh, Steve O'Donnell, um, uh, were both humorous. And at one point, one of them was working for the Letterman show and the other one was working for Saturday Night Live. And Mark was once interviewed and asked whether he was jealous when Steve won an Emmy and he didn't. And Mark thought for a long time and said, not at all. I feel he won one for the team. <laughs> um, and I think that's how I feel about you. I well, feel you always won one for the team. And, and I feel the same way. And, and we haven't really overlapped so much in the places we've gone. Um, there's certainly parallels, but they're not, um, they're not road crossings. Uh, which I think is important. Um, yeah. So we both now teach young people who are talented writers and want to make it as writers. And in other words, they want to spend their lives doing what we have been lucky enough to spend our lives doing. But the climate has changed. It's so much harder to make it as a writer. Um, as the head of an MFA program, a very good one at Stony Brook, um, can you talk a little bit about how things have changed and what you say to your students to make sure that they are being realistic about the lives that lie ahead? Um, it, it, mostly my perspective is to say, send to this place, send to that place. It's different now than it was before, but you have to keep continuing. And the underlying importance of what one thinks about when one writes is just stays the same. Um, uh, in memoir writing, uh, today I taught a memoir class and I had them watch the uh, episodes of The Moth to, um, to talk about storytelling and to get the rules from The Moth um, about how to construct that and and talk about people like Tara Clancy, who wrote the Clancy's of Queens and how Tara Clancy used the moth to develop the book. And that's what Frank McCourt did uh, many decades ago in Irish pubs. So it, it's more about the approach. And I'm so not wanting to discourage anybody um, that that's my take on it. What do you say, Anne? Well, you know, I tell them that it's getting harder and harder to put the ramen on the table, but um, my students are undergraduates, uh, so they're not in an MFA program. So they're a little younger, but some of them are very good writers, and I teach mostly juniors and seniors. And I tell them, try it for three or four years. Um, and if it doesn't work out, you'll never regret having devoted those three or four years, whether it's trying to write a book or whether it's working as a journalist, as many of them do. Um, it's, you know, if you end up going to law school, you get into a better law school because you'll be a much more interesting person. And so it's going to be win-win. Um, and enough of them have succeeded that I know it's not impossible. And I guess, and I was thinking about, um, something that uh, Roger Rosenblatt wrote to us uh, recently, um, saying that people were writing to him about Ukraine and saying, I have no words. And Roger said, of course we have words. Um, that's what we do. We have to have words. And I do believe that teaching our students that they do have words for whatever they need to say and that they develop their voices so they can use those words better, that that's a really useful thing. Um, 
Uh, one of my former students sent me an email last week. She's currently volunteering with Russian-speaking refugees in Poznan, Poland. Um, she'd previously been living in Russia. Um, and she uh, told me the story of an eight-year-old girl who had been rummaging among all the art supplies in the little makeshift camp to try to find college-ruled paper. And Lucy said to her, um, do you want to write something? And the little girl turned to her and said, no, I don't want to write something. I need to write something. And that need is what's just so crucial, but it, it, it's the need that you always had, Anne, um, the entire time I've known you. Um, and I feel I had that same need. I just, I just can't not. You can't not. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the book that you're working on now? It, it was really fascinating to hear you talk about that, uh, uh, to hear what you had to say about eugenics. Tell us about that book. Um, well, it really is about discovering why I would hear certain things that I heard when I was growing up. I just didn't understand them. And they would never have been made clear to me. Uh, mm -hmm. It was research that made me understand that, oh, maybe that's the case. That's what happened. Um, it, but, it, it, you know, so much of it is about discrimination, about um, uh, feeling that I just have to, there are deaf people all over the world in every country, um, in every walk of life. Uh, and so that's really important to me. But I also see my father still being discriminated against. I see, you know, I still interpret um, remotely. And um, to see what happens still bothers me. Um, not long ago, I was interpreting for a woman. Um, well, it was actually three years ago, right before COVID. And um, a, a doctor came in who had a heavy accent. Uh, uh, that woman used ASL. And he got in front of me and went up to the woman and said, read my lips. And she said, no, no, I have an interpreter. And he said, read my lips. I don't want you to use the interpreter. And I said, it's my job. So here I am jumping over his shoulder to sign. He wasn't allowing her to communicate. Mm -hmm. He was the anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. She didn't she didn't let him know if she'd eaten or not, she could have died. Um, so it, there's really, um, there's such an importance to me about all that. Now, Anne, I understand that you're planning to write about your mother. Um, well, not a book about my mother. Um, I'm, I, I'm not writing something about my mother for publication. I couldn't write a memoir about my mother because all the interesting things in her life happened before I was born, so I didn't witness them. I, I would be just like a biographer, whereas in my father's uh, case, although many of the things that made him well known happened before I was born, some of the most interesting things, including how he dealt with his blindness, I got to observe firsthand. Um, but I uh, have written something that I'll just privately print for family, just a, a, a without any literary style, um, deliberately so, just a very straightforward account of my mom's life so that my children um, will at least have the facts there. Um, my mom, whom you, you knew, um, was uh, the uh, uh, first uh, woman war correspondent in China during the Second World War. Um, and before that, uh, she was a screenwriter in MGM and wrote a movie for Andy Rooney and Judy Garland. And so her life as the only woman in various spheres where um, uh, that were completely dominated by men was a real inspiration to me. But on the other hand, the fact that she had more or less surrendered to the, you know, general cultural uh, prohibitions against being a working mom, um, and was uh, pretty unhappy, I think, uh, sitting at home being a housewife when she had done that. That was also a message um, that I imbibed and it made me uh, very determined that I wanted to have a family, but I also wanted to work. Hi, Alice. 
Hi, Alice. Hi, ladies. You guys are just wonderful how close you are and the things that you've shared. Thank you. I mean, it's just been amazing. I feel like I'm listening in on someone's private conversation. So <laughs> it's, it's just terrific. Uh, we do have a question, though, and I don't want to, I wanted to leave enough time for the um, asking of it. Uh, Adrian Unger asked, did you act as readers for each other's work when you were roommates? If so, what did you learn from each other that has stayed with you today? You want to start with that, Lillian? Thank you, Adrian, for that question. Um, uh, Anne was a wonderful reader for me. I was, I'm not as accomplished as Anne ever um, in that regard. Um, but uh, it, it, I just was so grateful to Anne for her reading, her close reading of my memoir. That was really important to me. Um, and Anne, you want to? Take it well, I think that what mainly, I mean, I, I did read your book, um, uh, but I'm not sure that editing was the main thing that we gave each other. It was more the sense of enthusiasm and support of sort of, you can do this. And we still do that. Um, so uh, uh, we, um, we were doing it every week and then every two weeks and then every three, but now once a month, we have a Zoom that's supposed to be only an hour, but it's usually longer with our friend Jane Condon, who is here tonight. Um, and Jane will try out her jokes on us. I mean, we, we still are the audience. Um, and Luann and I will talk about the things that we're thinking of writing. And um, we never get criticism from each other. It's all you go, girl. And... I mean, it's sort of amazing because we met when we were in our 20s and um, in, I met Jane when I was 17. I met Luann when I was in my early 20s and now we're in our late 60s and we've, we're, we've aged in so many ways, but our relationship, I would say, hasn't changed that much, although um, it's deepened in many ways, and we've supported each other through the loss of parents and a spouse and a sibling. Um, and uh, it's not just writing, it's pretty much everything, but the fact that we're all writers is certainly at the core. And, and I think that um, being able to tell the stories hmm. helps us figure out how to tell the stories on the page. Um, I'll never forget you going and um, the when there were polar bears and the fellow had his arm out the window and you would come home and tell me the stories and then you would write about them. So I, I think that it helps us shape our stories when we tell them to each other and then discover more and go more in depth. Yeah, I mean, we're still doing that. It's, it's like sending your students to the moth, uh, but we were like people at the moth, except, uh, you know, when we were sharing a loft, we were at the moth, but with an audience of one, but, you know, a great audience. Yeah, I'd come back from reporting a story at Life Magazine, and and I would tell it to you, and I would see which parts you were interested in, and I would think, oh, and then it would help me think about the structure. How do I want to tell this on the page? We all need that, and, and we're still doing that. We're still doing that in our monthly Zooms with and Jane. But now we don't have to wear our bathrobes anymore. <laughs> well, for those of us who have had a chance to share this evening with you, it is a rare and precious friendship that you have. And I hope you, I, I can tell that you celebrate it. And it's just something that you've shared with us tonight. And it's tremendously meaningful. Um, I do have to ask the last two questions of the evening. Um, and because I am a bookseller and I own a bookstore, I, it has to be book related. And I am reminding everyone that you have written material that is worth sharing and, 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 and absorbing and having. And uh, the first question that I ask is, do you know of any emerging writer that we might not know about that you would like to put on our radar? You go first. So um, my choice is uh, somebody who hasn't been published in English yet. It's um, the Goncourt Prize winner, uh, Mohammed Mugar Sar, and it's the, will it'll be translated. I don't know the exact translation into English, but it's the most secret memory of people. Um, so uh, I've just started reading that and really enjoying it. It's really brilliant. And 
And I'd like to tell you about a novel by a former student of mine, um, one of the students who's really made it as a writer. This is her first book. Her name is Sanjana Sathian. It's a novel called Gold Diggers, and it's a wonderful work of magical realism, a coming of age story that um, plays with the myth of the model minority the way a cat might play with a mouse. Nice. You'll notice I was writing while you were telling us that. So thank you very much. Okay, ladies, what are you reading? Oh, yeah. what's, what's on your night? Um, so two books, um, The Family Chow oh, cool. by Sam Chang and um, Dickens. I never read the Pickwick Papers. Oh, my gosh. Well, wow. I, last summer I read David Copperfield for the first time, and I just felt that I was living with the characters in David Copperfield, getting in bed every night. I couldn't wait to, you know, get out of the incredibly fat book and see what they were up to. Um, but what I just finished reading was Working by Robert Caro. So oh. while we all wait for the fifth volume of his Lyndon Johnson biography, we can sort of um, while away the time by reading a much shorter book, which <laughs> is all about, um, it's an incredible close-up view of his extraordinary reporting and research techniques that he's used while writing about Johnson mm -hmm. and, and Robert Caro. Um, and, uh, sorry, and, and Robert Moses. And it's, um, it, it simultaneously inspired me and also made me incredibly exhausted because every page, uh, it's hard to imagine an actual mortal ever working that hard, but it's a fantastic book. Wow, that's great. So different and yet so rich. So ladies, well, as I've said before, what a wonderful evening. This is what Write in America is all about. You've inspired us. You've um, you know, shared your wonderful work with us, and I am going to have to sign off. So thank you so much for everything. Really, it's been great. Um, thank you, Anne and Luann, for participating in Write America this evening, and to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you. Thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each Monday evening. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Bright Americans, I said before. We hope to see you next Monday at 7 as we welcome Meg Woolitzer and Delia Efron. Please remember to check out Bird's Books Write America page where you can sign up for upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. <laughs>